Hello everybody and welcome to the wine cast. Though I always figured I'd do a cast on Texas wines at some point, I hadn't planned on one in the near future until an opportunity to travel to Austin came up, and I thought that while there I'd make it a point to learn about and experience as much as I could of the Lone Star State's wine culture and industry. I'm happy to report that I had a great time while in Texas and came away with a real appreciation for what growers, winemakers, and wine lovers are doing there, and I thought I'd share what I learned with you. There's a lot to cover, so let's jump in, but I hope you'll stick around to the very end of the cast, because I've got a lot of people to thank for helping to make my visit a successful one. As New World wine-producing regions go, Vitis vinifera came early to Texas, with vines first arriving there at the hands of Franciscan missionaries in the 1680s. The Franciscans were nothing if not consistent and brought to Texas the same grape they took with them to the other reaches of the Spanish Empire the ever-dependable and fairly unexciting mission grape that they used mostly to make communion wine. Winemaking took hold in Texas, and by 1900, there were 25 working wineries in the state, but the industry would soon be dealt a really hard blow by prohibition in 1920. Very few wineries survived that ordeal, and it didn't help that Texas was one of four states that opted to remain dry after the repeal of prohibition at the national level in 1933. Thankfully, Texas only extended statewide prohibition for two more years, but even after the state government relaxed its ban on the sale of alcohol, a large number of counties exercised the right to opt for varying degrees of local prohibition, a feature of Texas drink culture that remains in play today, with, as of late 2017, six out of Texas' 254 counties being completely dry and prohibiting all sales of alcohol, 198 counties being damp or moist and either limiting the sale of only some types of alcohol or containing a combination of municipalities that do and don't prohibit those sales, and 55 being wet and allowing sales of alcohol anywhere in the county. All of these factors, plus at least one additional hardship that we'll cover later in the cast, combine to make wine production in Texas an uphill battle. And it's legitimate to say that the modern Texas wine industry didn't really begin until the 1960s, a decade that saw a resurgence of plantings, especially vitis vinifera plantings, and the 1970s and 80s that saw the opening of a number of important commercial wineries in the state. In spite of these obstacles and the youth of the industry, Texas is off to a running start as a U.S. wine producer, and it's currently home to eight American viticultural areas, or AVAs. The largest of these, and fun fact, second largest AVA in the U.S. at about 9.6 million acres, is the Texas Hill Country AVA that, despite its size, only has about 1,100 acres under vine and is planted most heavily to Cab Sauve and Merlot, followed by Tempranillo and Syrah. This AVA contains two smaller AVAs, Fredericksburg and Bell Mountain, which is the oldest of Texas AVAs, established in 1986. Sitting south of the Red River that forms the Oklahoma-Texas border is the aptly named Texoma AVA, where, again, Cab Sauv leads the list of cultivars, followed by two important hybrid grapes for the Texas industry, Blanc du Bois and Lenoir, also known as Black Spanish. Though it's smaller geographically than the Texas Hill Country AVA, the Texas High Plains AVA has twice as many acres under vine and is the source of the majority of Texas wine output and the home of some of the oldest wineries in the modern state, including the Llano Estacado and Pheasant Ridge wineries in Lubbock, Texas. South and west of the High Plains are the Escondido Valley and Texas Davis Mountain AVAs, and finally, straddling the border with New Mexico, is the Mesilla Valley, most of which is in New Mexico, but a bit abuts the city of El Paso. What grapes grow in these AVAs and what kind of wines are made from them? Well, before answering that question, it's worth saying a few words about where Texas vineyard land is located in the grand scheme of worldwide plantings and how that location affects the climate the grapes grow in. Most Texas vineyards lie between 35 and 29 degrees north latitude, so if you took a map of Europe and North Africa with North America superimposed onto it like this one, and then marked off an area containing Texas AVAs, you'd get something like this, with Texas vineyards falling within the same latitudes as San Diego, the north end of Baja California, and not to put too fine a point on it, the Sahara Desert. So again, not to put too fine a point on it, Texas gets hot, Thanks, though, to the influence of the Gulf of Mexico, that heat will variously express as a hot maritime climate that will progressively become more of a hot continental climate the farther inland you go. Though there are vines planted throughout Texas, including in southeast Texas close to the coast, the AVAs are in a tricky situation climate-wise because of the possibility of very cold winters as the climate gets more continental. And these winters, along with spring frost, can be a threat to vines. 
Given the extremes of temperature possible where Texas AVAs are found, elevation becomes an important factor in moderating temperatures, especially during the hot growing season, and it's no surprise to find words like hill, mountain, and high plains in the names of several of those viticultural areas. The high heat during the growing season, even in areas with higher altitude and good diurnal swings, can make it hard to maintain good acid levels in the grapes and in the wines made from them making acidification a relatively common, though not universal, practice in Texas, as it is in other very warm climate wine-producing regions. Texas ranks as somewhere between the 5th and 8th largest wine-producing state in the U.S., depending on the year, and on who's collecting the data and what metrics they're using on that data. Over the last few years, Texas has produced about 1.8 million cases of wine per year, both from vinifera and non-vinifera grapes, and in 2015 there were about 5,000 acres under vine throughout the whole state, with about 64% of those acres under vine to red varieties and 36 to white, though in terms of actual production the numbers are closer to an even split between red and white. Though its yearly ranking as a producer in 5,000 acres of wine grapes is certainly respectable, keep in mind that in the U.S., everything gets dwarfed by California, with its 600,000 acres under vine, 45,000 of which are in Napa Valley alone. Still, what the Texas industry may lack in sheer size, it makes up for it in diversity with over 100 varietals planted, about 20 of which are either hybrids or species native to North America. The top eight varieties planted in Texas are Cabernet Sauvignon, with Merlot and Tempranillo tied for the number two spot, followed by Lenoir, Black Spanish, a hybrid, and then by the white grapes Muscat Canelli, Viognier, and Blanc du Bois, another hybrid, with Syrah following just behind. Hybrids in certain species of native grapes like Muscadine are very important to the Texas industry because of their resistance to a plague that's bedeviled it for some time, Pierce's disease. Pierce's disease is interesting and important enough to someday merit its own cast, but for now we can get away with noting that it's a plant disease caused by a bacterium, Xylella fastidiosa, that can and does affect a number of agricultural plants, and in grapevines it leads to a blockage of the xylem, or vascular tissue in the plant, that transports water from the roots of the plant to the leaves, where the plants use that water during photosynthesis to produce sugars that are transported by another vascular system, the phloem, to developing tissue or to where it can be stored, like, say, a grape berry. The bacteria cause the development of plaques and other substances that can block the xylem, leading to conditions like leaf scorch and chlorosis, and ultimately to the death of the vine itself. Pierce's disease can be deadly to vines, but it's in no way harmful to humans, nor does it affect the quality of juice from the berries of affected vines. The disease can be spread by any insect that feeds on the xylem of a grapevine, but leaf-hopping insects like the glassy-winged sharpshooter pictured on the right are particularly common vectors. For a while, the conventional wisdom in Texas held that Pierce's disease was confined to southeast Texas, roughly the area south of Route 10 and east of Route 35, an area that was planted mostly to resistant hybrids or to native grapes like muscadine. But starting in the 1990s, incursions of the disease were noticed in the hill country as well as in west Texas. And there's been some evidence of it as far north as the high plains, none of which is a good thing. The bacterium that causes the disease doesn't do well in areas with cold winters, with the cold seeming to kill it off during the vine's winter dormancy. But as global climate changes, there's at least the possibility that it can spread north, not just in Texas, but elsewhere in the U.S. too. This disease is probably the single major reason why commercial vitis vinifera cultivation is impossible in the southeastern United States, and it also almost wiped out vinifera cultivation in Southern California, an area that had been the center of gravity for wine grapes in California until the late 1800s, and that's only now recovering but is still threatened by the disease. Pierce's disease is no joke, and while it can't be treated, it can be managed through pest control and replanting, all strategies that Texas growers are using to curb its potential impact on their industry. Speaking of the Texas industry and of its labeling laws more specifically, Texas wines follow the general labeling requirements for wines in the United States. So if Texas or one of its counties is given as the appellation of origin, 75% of the wine in the bottle has to be from grapes grown in Texas or the named county. That number gets a bump to 85% if the appellation is one of Texas eight American viticultural areas and to 95% if the appellation is a named vineyard. Viticulture in Texas is on the increase, but there's still more demand for wine grapes, particularly vinifera grapes, than the state's growers can meet. So you may see wines from Texas labeled with the America Appellation of Origin, and that's an indicator that less than 75% of the wine was made from Texas grapes. 
This isn't something that you see as much in wine from the top four producing states in the U.S., California, Washington, New York, and Oregon, because of the higher volume of vinifera wine produced there. But wineries in states with smaller industries will often use out-of-state grapes either to meet demand every year or during a year where production was set back due to bad weather or some other unforeseen event. A more curious labeling that you may see is the for sale in Texas only designation that can be used by wineries in other states too, provided they swap out Texas for their state's name. What's up with that? Well, as Russ Kane has pointed out in his excellent blog on Texas wines, vintagetexas.com that I'll link to in the video info, though this designation can give the impression that bottles with it are a special, maybe even a prestige bottling only available to locals, the fact is that it means almost the same thing as the American Appalachian of origin. Why the two different designations? Well, in the U.S., producers can ask the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau that oversees wine labeling in the United States to allow them to opt out of federal labeling requirements for Appalachian of origin if they're willing to disqualify their wines from participating in interstate commerce. In other words, they don't have to put an Appalachian of origin on the wine, especially a thoroughly non-prestigious one like America, if they stipulate that their wine can only be sold in the state where it's produced. How can you be sure you're getting a Texas wine that's at least three quarters Texas grapes? Easy. Look for the word Texas on the label. Not Texas style or for sale in Texas only, but Texas or the name of one of the AVAs. Quality producers in the Lone Star State seem to be sensitized to this issue, and justly proud as they are of their wines and their grapes, will often add additional language on the label to give consumers as much information as they can about the provenance of their grapes. As with other casts, I like to end with some practical recommendations on what to look for if you want to try some wines from the region I covered. And when dealing with a small industry like Texas, the first bit of advice is to try what you can find, as Texas wines are hard to come by outside of the Lone Star State. But you can make it a special point to be on the lookout for two grapes that seem to be turning into Texas' signature red and white, Tempranillo and Viognier. That these two grapes should be doing well in Texas should come as no surprise since Texas' premier growing regions have features in common with central Spain and the northern Rhone, the spiritual and ancestral homes of Tempranillo and Viognier, and that an affinity for warm climate areas where temperature is moderated by altitude is one to keep in mind when looking for Texas wines. And if you see a varietal or blended Texas wine made from grapes that are closely associated with Spain, the Rhone, Italy, or Portugal, then jump on it. As I mentioned earlier, I had the good fortune to be in Austin in the Texas Hill Country while researching this cast, and while there I came across varietal bottlings and blends containing Sangiovese, Albarino, Grenache, Morved, Vermentino, Montepulciano, Sagrantino, Alianico, Tanat, Tinta Cao, and Turiga Nacional, to name a few. So there's a lot being done in Texas, to great effect, with grapes that seem like they should flourish there, and you should check them out if you can find them. Finally, the hybrids that have become so important to the Texas industry, particularly Blanc du Bois and Lenoir, or Black Spanish, can be made into some really interesting wines, and you shouldn't shy away from checking them out. Hybrids have a bad name relative to vinifera in the wine world, and to what degree that's deserved is a bigger issue than I can tackle here. But I can say that I had a couple of expressions of both of those grapes that were quite remarkable, and whatever your feelings about hybrids in general, the fact is, given the reality of Pierce's disease and the challenges of Texas climate, hybrids will be a part of the wine culture there for a while, and you should try them if you get the chance. Thanks for joining me for another wine cast. As promised, I want to end this cast by saying thank you and giving some shout outs to some great people who helped inform me about Texas wine while I was there. And these include the nice folks at Texas Reds and Whites, a tasting room in Austin that pours only Texas wines, and preferably only those made from all Texas grapes. The Austin Wine Merchant, a terrific bottle shop in that city where I found some very intriguing examples of the Lone Star Grape. The winemakers and tasting room staff at both Lewis Wines and Ron Yates Wines in the Texas Hill Country, and a very special thank you to my fellow YouTuber, Stuart, over at his channel, Wine on the Dime, who took time out of his day to schlep me around the Hill Country to check out some excellent local vino. Want to see what I drank while in Texas and what I thought of it? Have a look at my Instagram at Unknown Winecaster Drinks Wine. Thanks again for watching and sticking with me. If this cast was interesting and helpful to you, please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and always feel free to leave a comment. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.